Welcome everybody Hi to there. Atlanta Live. We're just so glad to be here tonight and glad you're joining us tonight. And we yes. have an awesome program uh, lined up tonight. I want to thank you for being with us. Tonight's guest we have with us in the house, Dee Armstrong from the Dee Armstrong yes. Show. And she is uh, all the way from Columbus, Georgia and mm -hmm. been with NBC for many years. I'm excited about having her with us. Yeah. And we have uh, Pastor Lawrence Young with us tonight. And and he's from uh, the United Methodist Church, Cascade United Methodist Church, right here in Atlanta, celebrating their 90th yes. anniversary. It's so going to be a powerhouse. It's going to be a great night great tonight. tonight. Yes. We also have Clark Wise with us from Greensboro, North Carolina. My and hometown. Yes. You were born there, right? <laughs> I was. I Very was. Good. Did some growing up there. Yeah. And they've got a, a just a great group with them tonight. And they're going to be singing and just doing a, an awesome, awesome job. So we want you to stay with us for the entire program. Yes, and we've got some amazing interview guests as well and another musical guest that we're getting ready to share with you. But our, one of our interview guests tonight is Dr. John DeGarmo, and he is with, he's a foster care consultant. He's also an author of seven books on foster care and just has an amazing testimony and will share with us his passion for foster care. And then also Bernadine Cantrell, who's a dear friend of mine right from the Atlanta area, was just crowned Miss Senior Georgia, and she's got an amazing testimony. He's also an author and a speaker. And she's so, got her crown on. Yes, so. she does. So yeah. we're excited and we are going to be interviewing our first musical guest right here on the set. So please help us welcome vocal event, Jay Perrick, Bubba, tell me, Hallman. Okay, yes. And then we also have Darren Morton, correct? And thank you guys so much for being here. We're so thank excited. You. you know, I told you as we started out um, talking this evening that my husband starts his day listening to the very first song that you guys are going to play here today. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how y'all got together and uh, kind of what happened when y'all well, hit this song that's just taken off. Well, it's, it's, God, it's, a, it's, it's a total God thing, and I know everybody throws that phrase around a lot, but it has all been uh, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ actually put this together. We met probably about, what, 20 years ago or so, and I was singing, quote, unquote, professionally back then, and, and these two guys uh, were singing in a group together, and they wrote a song, and we recorded it and that kind of thing, and so all these many years later, we've kind of gotten back up together, and now we're singing together when we can, and uh, we were looking for songs for a particular CD that we were in the studio recording. And uh, we called a friend of ours that happens to be a songwriter. And I said, Belinda, do you have anything that you would like to send us? We need some songs. And she said, I've got just the perfect song for you. Wow. She sent it. And we, we heard maybe two lines. Yeah. And we <laughs> knew then we had to record this song. It spoke, it spoke to a lot of different people. And it mm -hmm. has over across the country. And to God be the glory for that. But this is one of those songs where it's spoke to each and all three of us on a mm -hmm. personal level because we were going through our own personal trials and uh, and the Lord used this song to minister to us and when it ministers to the artist then we can more effectively deliver that message to the listener and you definitely yeah. definitely have yes and you're from Alabama we are now how do you get together to practice when you're all spread out well that's that presents a challenge uh, yeah. because Darren is from Birmingham area right. uh, Bubba is more from the Jasper area and I okay. live more in the Anniston area and okay. so we get together whenever we can and that's that's pretty well the way we have to leave it it's we don't have a set schedule that we get together and practice on this night and sing on this night hey we may we drive a pickup truck so we're liable to practice going down the road on in the, the pickup road. truck. You, you know go. what I think that's awesome and if you can just tell the way you guys harmonize and how God has blessed you and your music yes. and your and people are just hearing your songs and being blessed by your songs I know you're all very passionate for worship so we don't want to keep our audience waiting anymore. We really want to uh, to get you guys out here and sing this song. And sometimes he whispers, talk to that just for a moment before you, because that is the title of the song that, that we're getting ready to hear. Yes. And so what does that mean to each of you? Darren, why don't we start with you real quick? Well, it's just be still and know that I am God. I mean, Amen. That's, that's what it means to me is he's, he whispers to us. He's not always in the clouds. He's not always in the big lightning and thunder. He's in the still small voice. Right. Exactly. It, Bubba? It, it goes to him being our personal savior. Amen. To him being right by our side, 
Uh, he's got us in the, in the palm of his hand, and he wow. speaks to us just in like his precious child. Ways. And Jay, real quickly. When, yeah. I, when I was a kid, my mom, I'd cut up in church. My mom would lean forward, and she would grab my arm and pinch it, and she would grab me, and she would say, she would whisper in my ear, and she would tell me either be still and quiet, or I'm going to kill you when I get home. Okay. And that <laughs> message was for me and me only because I was her child. Right. And it didn't pertain to anybody else. That's and right. so it's a daily reminder that if I walk close enough to him, I'm his child, and I can hear even the slightest whisper from a Amen. mighty God. Amen. Well, please, to we want to hear it. it. God, God bless, bless you. you. Thank you. left me with more tears than laughter. I don't know how God's going to move, but I know he knows what. Sometimes he whispers So I'll keep listening And waiting for him And I'll keep trusting I His hope he will feed. I don't know, I don't know how he's going to move. Louder than the 
much. Jay Parrick and the vocal event. You and think Mike was at home? Ah, uh, no, he was watching. Online, it's for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so you can find them on Facebook. You can also find them on uh, just Google them for their website for Jay Parrick and vocal event. And we have our next guest here with us tonight that I'm real excited about because I have a real passion. We have a passion for our children in the area, our foster kids in, yes. in particular, that um, really struggle. And so we're gonna talk to uh, Dr. John DeGama. So please welcome, thank you so much for being here thank with you. us tonight. Thank and you so much. You've written several books. You've written seven books all total. Yes. Got we're a couple. too young for that. I know. Well, it's all, it's all makeup. It's you just... started when you were 12. That's right, that's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us how um, how you became passionate about uh, foster care. Let's start there. Well, my wife and I moved back from Australia to America, back to the Atlanta area, and I was teaching in a rural school in Georgia, and I was noticing a lot of children coming through my classroom that had uh, behavior problems, had academic problems, and missing a lot of school. And I kept asking myself, why is this? What, what seems to be the problem? And then I met some of the birth parents, and I realized, yes, it starts in the home. Mm -hmm. So I went home to my wife and said, hey, you know, we lost our first child. We have three healthy children now. How can we help other children? What can we do to serve these children who are in need? Mm -hmm. A great deal of prayer led us to foster parenting. And 50, 50 children later, here we are. Wow. 50 children. That's right. Yes, ma'am. How, oh, how do you raise 50 children and, you know, not get so emotionally? How do you, oh. how do, you do that? Well, <laughs> with a lot of prayer, but you do get emotional. Oh, yeah. my goodness, you do. You know, I hear a lot from people who are now foster parents that say, John, I couldn't do what you do. Right. It would hurt too much to give the kids back. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know, our hearts rip out because we are to give these kids what they need the most. Mm -hmm. They need stability and they need security, but what they need the most is unconditional love. It's for somebody to love them so much that when they leave, it breaks our hearts. Mm -hmm. And John, that's why it's so important. Your aspect of, of bringing Christ-centered love into the middle of the foster care program, yeah. I think is such an important component because these kids, when they do go, they go back possibly to their families sometimes. or sometimes they age out right. and they can take the Lord. They take your love with them, mm. but they take the Lord with them everywhere they go if you're depositing that into their life. So speak to that component of your passion for foster care. Well, you, you, you touched on it right there, unconditional love. God loves us unconditionally, mm -hmm. and we are to give these children as much unconditional love as we possibly can. Matthew 25, 35 says, For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you gave me clothing. That is these children. That's what these children are. Jesus talks about the widows and the orphans. There's 500,000 kids in America on any given day who are in the mm -hmm. foster care system. That's these orphans. That mm -hmm. is our next mission field. Wow, and you have four children of your own. Is I have three biological. Three. I've adopted three from foster care. Wow. We have another one living with us right now who was homeless. Wow. And we've had four failed adoptions, which means adoptions did not work out. And then I even have a, I even have a grandchild from foster care as well right now. That's so awesome. yeah, it's been nice. So now, like with the one who, who you have now who is homeless, how, where do you start with a child who's been in such traumatized circumstances? Love. Yeah. Patience. Mm -hmm understanding and give him a chance. This is a poor, a poor child who no one gave a chance to. And yeah. you know what, my wife and I said, absolutely, we'll, we'll give him a chance. That's yeah. awesome, yeah. 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 And what does discipline look like in, in you know? In our house, yeah. well, we've had as many as 11 kids in our house at one time. Right. So it is a circus, it is uh, never boring, it yeah. is always action. And that's um, why you wrote the book, Love and Mayhem. Yeah, yeah it's, I like it's, exactly. It's so it, is, it is mayhem. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's Christ-centered. Uh, discipline, it's, it's consistency, it's structure. Many of these kids have never had any consistency. Correct. They've never had any structure whatsoever. So what's that? You know, uh, if, they, if they should do something, if they should make a poor choice, we talk about those choices. We talk about the consequences and I tell them, you know, I love you. This is the consequence. I love you anyways and we'll move on from there. Yeah. Now you're obviously fostering and so you take this mission, you know, critical, right? To, into uh, your home and into your family. Right. But you also have a ministry and you go around and you work with churches and um, Christians all over, I guess, the United States yes. to help them understand how they can bring more Christ-centered fostering to their area. So speak to your actual ministry where you help to help churches and so forth figure out what can they do? What can we do? What can our audience do to right. help be a part of the solution? Sure, sure. You know, not everybody can be a foster parent. I get it. It's the hardest thing I've done, but everybody can help. 
in some way. So when I speak to the churches, I tell them my story, I say, hey, this, I've struggled with this. This is the hardest thing I've done. It's the most rewarding thing I've done. It's the most important thing I've done, but it's challenging. And I share the stories and I talk about, hey, this is how your church can help children in foster care, whether it's setting up a closed closet, whether it's helping the foster parents uh, during holidays, whether it's helping the children as a mentor, whether it's bringing meals, whether it's opening up a foster parent association in your church. There are a number of ways today's church can do that. Yeah. Our home church had started a foster care program called We Foster and works with an agency similar to you that come, comes along and helps that church organize and set things up so that they can recruit foster parents and they can help set up a network around those foster parents because foster parents can have a lot more success if they've got a support system. They're oh, not yeah. just left alone, mm -hmm. you know, to raise these children on their own. There's a big problem with foster parent retention and that is retaining foster parents. It's a burnout job. There's tremendous, when you, when you bring in children into your home with all these stresses and these anxieties and have suffered so mm -hmm. much abuse, you know, it's a strain on your marriage. So mm -hmm. one of the things I talk about is foster parenting and marriage as well. Uh, but the church can also pray for the birth parents. Mm -hmm. Now I struggled with that yes. for a while. You know, for mm -hmm. I, I had a when I first started foster parenting, I really struggled with these birth parents who had done heinous, heinous crimes to their children. Mm. But then I realized these are children of God. God loves them just as much as, as he loves me. My sin is no less than their mm. sin. Look at the plank of my own eye. So I also talked to the church about praying for the birth parents, being a witness for them as well. It's just one it's of the powerful. ways we can do that. Talk a little bit about how it does affect your marriage and, and what are some of the ways that you all have found to navigate through the difficulties. Well, when you have seven in diapers at one time, yeah. you have 11 in the house, it wow. is, uh, you know, you really, really depend on your spouse. You need a yes. medal. <laughs> Uh, I don't well, know. Seven in well, diapers. We need an Alice. We're so far above the Brady Bunch level. We yeah, need an Alice. Yeah. And my wife keeps telling me she needs a wife. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we pray together daily. Mm, powerful. Uh, we yes. rely upon each other. We, we, we gain strength from each other. We support each other. And we give each other time off as well. You know, when I'm often in Texas or Alaska or Michigan training foster parents, and then I come back, you know, I tell my wife, hey, it's your turn to go off. And, have you know have a break so to speak it's but good. it's a, it's a it's a, a marriage that's centered in prayer mm -hmm. you know, mm. first and foremost yeah putting god in the center talk a little bit about this one book and i know you've got quite a few but love and mayhem this is a memoir is it not that's right that's okay. right i wanted to I wanted to share with one of my missions is um, i've devoted my entire life to foster care helping the children helping foster parents and helping the general public understand more about foster care because before I was a foster parent I had no clue. Sure. So this book is about foster parenting. I, I, I uh, don't sugarcoat it. I say this is tough. This is challenging. These are the things I struggle with. These are some of the adventures that we go through and what a joy it is. Mm -hmm. So it's a book that for the general public to understand, oh, this is what foster parenting is all about and hopefully encourage people to, to take that journey. I think that's awesome. Yes. Very helpful. Absolutely. And um, I, I just, um, I'm interested to know how you got the call, the initial call. What was the the pivotal moment in your life where you knew God had called you to do this? You know, our first child died of a disease called anencephaly, or it's a condition where the brain never forms. And I really was in a dark place at, for, for a long time. I was, um, I really was resisting a lot of things in my life. Later, when we moved back to America and we had our children, uh, I, I woke up from a dream. It actually was a nightmare. And I felt as if fear had gripped every single aspect of my body. I felt encased in fear for about four days. I visited my minister and he said, you, you've got a, a path to, to choose here. Are you going to follow God or are you going to not? And um, I made the decision right then and there, and that's where it sprang from there. And now we devoted other aspects to our life. We're opening up group home for boys in foster care throughout Georgia. There's, there's many homes for girls. There are very, very few homes for boys. And when a boy in foster care hits the age of nine or 10 years of age, mm -hmm. Nobody wants them. They want a girl them. or they want a baby. And wow. I have met boys through my travels who have been in 30, 40, 50 different homes. Can oh, you imagine wow. what that does for attachment? Mm. So our home, never too late, never too late for hope, never too late for a family, never too late for love, is for those boys, a forever home for those boys. We're going to give them that hope and we're going to give them a place to find healing and a place to find unconditional love. I've ministered in group homes and I've ministered, you know, um, throughout Georgia in, with foster kids. I'll be speaking to some foster teens in a couple of weeks. And, but to see the hope that comes into these kids when they get into a home that's grounded 
um, in love for them, unconditional love for them. And most often when I see that,